site and that's on that um, little can I add Even to that then? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just <laughs> add, uh, we often use this term scaffolding when That's we think right. of learning the second and the third languages. It's like when we build a building, we have scaffolding that's in place mm -hmm. to support the construction process until the building can stand alone. Mm -hmm. So scaffolding the learner's learning of the second and third languages means that it doesn't mean that the teacher will use the first language as a medium of instruction necessarily when teaching the second and third languages because that's a little bit counterproductive, but it means that the teacher will not insist on the second language when the child is not yet ready to produce it. Mm -hmm. And that the teacher has to make sure that the child understands mm -hmm. everything the teacher says in the second language. So that means providing uh, meaningful, um, input to the child and helping the child produce the output that's necessary to develop conversational ability in a second language but that means that the first language is there so if the teacher asks a question and mm -hmm. nobody understands the question mm -hmm. then she has to provide some scaffolding to so that they understand the second language question sometimes that means putting it in the first language mm -hmm. sometimes that means exploring with the students what parts of the question they don't understand mm -hmm. Then when students respond, sometimes they can respond, but they don't have the perfect grammar in the second language or they're missing a few vocabulary words. So the scaffolding is where the teacher comes alongside the learner mm -hmm. and helps them fill in the gaps that they don't have. So often we see a teacher say, okay, can you say that in English? You know, when a, when a child gives a, either a first language answer or, or you know, a partial answer, mm -hmm. well, if the child could do it, they would have done it in the first place. So mm -hmm. that, that's when the child, the parent, sorry, the teacher should come in and scaffold their learning so that they are successful and they produce the correct output, but the teacher is helping them to do it rather than just expecting the child to know and do it themselves. You see how crucial the role is of the teacher yeah. then? Yeah. Right. Um, and then given that explanation, what is the role of translation or yeah. NLE? That's a good <laughs> question. A lot of people just, you know, that's what the code switching was based on, right? Mm -hmm. Translate back to the first language for comprehension's sake and then move on. But really, in terms of translation, we have to talk about several different things. So the oral component of teaching and learning mm -hmm. and also the materials. We say for the materials that for young learners, the first materials, shouldn't be translated books like Henny Penny or whatever from mm -hmm. English, because mm -hmm. that has no cultural context for the learner in the Philippines. It should be a story that reflects the learner, his heritage, his everyday experience, so that he can imagine himself being in that in story, story, being one of the characters of the story. Mm -hmm. So that's why we don't want to do a lot of translation. It's not that we're withholding that, because they will be exposed, exposed to um, Penny Penny and Jack and Jill and those stories eventually and we can translate those for later but for their initial reading we want them to engage in the, the story such that they can imagine themselves as being part of it. In the oral component uh, if we spend a lot of time in translation then the learners learn to ignore for example the English that the teacher uses because they know she's going to provide the L1 Yes. Right? So that means that actually their English is thwarted because they're not paying attention <laughs> to what the teacher says in English. They're just waiting for the L1 component. Mm -hmm. and, and it takes twice as much time. So we don't want to use a lot of translation. So translation is necessary and helpful, but should be used um, very thoughtfully and not on a regular basis. Rather, you know, as I said, if the, if the students don't understand something, the teacher can explore what, it, what part they don't understand, mm -hmm. or they might have to provide a full, full um, L1 translation, but it's not, it should not be a standard pedagogy that's used. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, you've already given us some tips on how to teach MLE, and um, the strategies that you mentioned, I, I think, are going to be very helpful, but um, what classroom, what other classrooms are you all a first language? Mm -hmm. um, Reading and writing are both crucial. So when we read, we get meaning from what we're reading, but also the process of reading teaches us to think abstractly as well. Mm -hmm. But it also, we can use that to introduce new vocabulary. Remember we said that five and six-year-olds, you know, for any learner, they're fluent in their mother tongue, 
for their age level, but we want right. to develop that fluency as they go through school and not just leaving it to the home to develop because they will develop oral fluency at home, but that is based on BICS, which is the basic interpersonal communication skills. Mm -hmm. Those are the conversational uh, languages that we use every day. We want to also focus on CALP, which is Cognitive Academic right. Language yeah. Proficiency, mm -hmm. because that language they need in school if they're going to succeed in school. So we use the first language to help them gain the, the cognitive academic language that they need. Um, so that's where the first language comes in. We don't necessarily need to recreate or, um, yeah, re or create academic terms in the first language, unless mm -hmm. the first language community really desires to do that. Mm -hmm. That's not necessary, but they need to be able to articulate for example, what photosynthesis is, mm -hmm. if they're going to understand, articulate it but in their first language. But how about there's no equivalent of that particular term in the first language? Then they should learn both, because after all, they're language learners, so they're learning Filipino and they're learning English. It's not a problem for them to learn two forms of the same academic um, concept. Mm -hmm. That children learn language and uh, progress in language learning fairly well if it's done right and done well. So it's not a problem for them to learn academic content um, in multiple languages. The, the other thing I want to talk about is writing. Traditionally, in many places, writing is limited to really penmanship. That's right. It's how you form the letters and how neatly you can... Psychomotor. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. But really, writing isn't talking so much about penmanship as it is about reproducing what we think mm -hmm. in written form on paper. That's a creative and a cognitive process that has to be developed. And it can only be developed in the first language because our second language, when we're young, our vocabulary is limited, our knowledge of how to put sentences together and phrases together is limited, and it actually becomes a barrier to writing our thoughts. Mm -hmm. So all the way through elementary school, Children should be encouraged to write their thoughts and their responses to their lessons in their first language. If the teacher then wants to um, help them transition that into mm -hmm. writing it, reproducing it in the yeah. second languages, that's great and it will help develop the second languages. But if the first language is bypassed, then students have a very hard time coming up with something of their own thinking in written form. Leanne, you mentioned earlier that translation can be done, but it should be done thoughtfully. What does it mean to do it thoughtfully? In the old system, when teachers used code switching, they did it automatically, right? Just all the time. So that forces children, or for some children, they stop listening for the, to the English. So they're not really imbibing much English because they know the L1 is coming. So the teacher needs to know what in the second language her learners understand that she is saying. Mm -hmm. Krashen talks about the I representing input mm -hmm. plus, plus one. one. So extending the language just beyond the students but not too far beyond that they can't access it. So using the second language, um, understanding where the learners are, but when you've extended the language a little bit too far, you might need to explain certain mm -hmm certain things in the second language, but I mean in the first language, but rather than just lumping everything in and providing the whole first language, the teacher needs to think about how much do they know that I'm saying, how much have they, have they had opportunity to learn, you know, not just in terms of I taught this yesterday and they're mm -hmm. supposed to know mm -hmm. it, That's right. but being aware of where the students are so that you're, we're not just automatically code switching because that's based on a completely different philosophy of education. Mm -hmm. So helping the learners um, and thinking about when, you, when we translate, using that translation process to also explore language, exploring what they didn't understand of the second language, exploring how to say it in the first language. Mm -hmm. And sometimes teachers can say, you know, give something in the second or third language and say, how do I say that in the first language? And then she's giving them opportunity to use their automatic tool mm -hmm. and she's also assessing whether they understood her in the second or third mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. and then she can move on. So the translation shouldn't be done automatically, like code switching. The teacher needs to know where her learners are mm -hmm. and help them along in the process. So again, thoughtfully and purposefully. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm.
We also noted earlier that MLE is a lot of things, right? And, and the framework is something that is definitely going to help in terms of cognitive development. But what does M the MLE framework really focus on? Okay. Um, MLE, starting with the first language first and adding other languages, develops cognitive um, facility for all of life. It focuses on academic development. It focuses on linguistic development, so language development, first language, second language, third language, etc. cetera. It um, incorporates social cultural um, aspects of the learning process. It really encompasses the whole learning process of the learner and addresses directly all of those issues. Whereas when we use just the second language strictly in school, we're, we're expecting learners to bypass what they already know. We're actually explicitly stating to students that what you know before you start school is <laughs> not very important. Mm -hmm. And this is a common misperception, right? Mm -hmm. What we want you to, know, to learn is are these facts that are embedded in the curriculum and in the textbooks, mm -hmm. but that re resorts to memorizing lists of information, mm -hmm. which isn't very helpful. It doesn't help learners necessarily develop their cognitive skills from an early age. Lots of people make it through the system quite well, but they also have other uh, resources that they use to make it through the system. And if we start with what the learners know, mm -hmm. and then we introduce the academic content and the languages, um, into what they already know and we build on what they know, they find it easier to learn the academics and to learn the languages. Mm -hmm. And they can learn in a social cultural environment where they're able to negotiate learning together and negotiate learning with the teacher rather than staring at the teacher saying, what is he I or she saying? Me. I don't understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And that just takes long, longer for mm -hmm. learners to understand what the teacher is saying and then to be able to respond. In this 